panelist, Larry Blackwood, and I'm here to talk about my exhibit, Synthesizing Icons. And before I start, I want to thank uh, several organizations. One is the Hockaday for hosting this exhibit, and this is my second exhibit at the Hockaday. My first one was about 10 years ago. <laughs> and um, so it's, I'm glad to be back and, and uh, happy to talk about this. Um, the other, another organization I need to thank is the Magda, the Montana Art Gallery Directors Association for sponsoring this exhibit as one of their traveling exhibits for the last two years. And then finally, I would like to thank the SLAM organization of Bozeman, which stands for support, Supporting Local Artists and, and Musicians, um, because they sponsored my application to Magda to do the exhibit. So there's a three-step process that's involved. You have to have a sponsor, they sponsor your application to uh, Magda, who then puts it out there and places like uh, the Hockaday pick that up for exhibition. Just a quick word about my own background. Uh, I've been interested and involved in uh, fine art photography since my teens, uh, which is a long time ago. Uh, I had a pretty long hiatus in the middle part of my life where I was too busy working and doing other things to do much with it, although I had done some dark, quite a bit of darkroom work early on, and then I kind of got away from photography altogether, but about 20 years ago I got back into it about the time that uh, digital cameras started getting really good and, and good enough to produce uh, quality images that could easily be worked into a fine art presentation of some sort. So. Been working on that um, since then, and during that time, I've transitioned from one sub, emphasizing one subject to another. Uh, the last time I was at the Hockey Day, it was I, exhibit was on uh, grain elevators, and it was shortly after that I started uh, being really interested in photographing crows and ravens, which is one reason why you see so many of these in this exhibit because they came out of that work. Um, and in fact, I have another uh, Magda uh, exhibition I traveled around with just photographs, black and white photographs of crows and ravens, and eventually that sort of morphed into this um, uh, composite photograph effort that I really find enjoyable and challenging and frustrating, and it's a lot more work, a lot more thinking than, than taking pictures, but it's really fun to do. So anyway, that's my basic background. and. I'm just going to talk about stories about some of these individual photographs and if anybody has any questions, feel free to anyway, I'm going to start out by talking about this one because this is the first composite image that I did. And the inspiration for this and the idea came about because I had seen um, at a museum somewhere a, actually a 3D sculpture of a, of a circle. I think it might have been like a wheel because it had spokes or something. And there were various animals around there, and I was looking at that, and at the time I was doing the crows and ravens and uh, magpies, the corvids in general, that's the class of birds that includes all three of those. Uh, and I thought, that could probably, that'd be fun to try to do something like that with some of my bird images. And so this is what came out of it. And the, the main photograph in here is a single crow with a, a red berry, it's like a crab apple or something in there. Uh, and then there's just another photograph that's repeated around the outside edge. And this is an example of why this is called synthesizing icons, because this uh, red berry in the beak of a crow is sort of, it was attracted my attention because of the, um, the myth or the, the creation uh, story that uh, has been around for hundreds of years amongst various indigenous tribes in the, in the North American Northwest, both in the U.S. and in Canada. And it's called, the story is called Raven Steals the Sun, or Raven Brings the Light. The Raven Steals the Sun is what I think about, where a raven basically was responsible for creating a world, and in part of what he did to do that was to go and steal the light. The sun is in a box somewhere that he stole and, and brought light to the world. And um, because of that story in, in, the, in the traditional art related to those indigenous peoples in that part of the, the continent, um, you see a lot of sculptures or drawings of stylized ravens or actual ravens with a big red ball in their mouth. And so 
this was, I was excited when I got the photograph of that because I've been thinking about those. Well, wouldn't it be cool if I could get an actual photograph of a crow or a raven with a red ball in its mouth? And so that is what, why, what this means to me uh, symbolically or iconically, the icons and the fact that I'm creating something that's not a direct reflection of the source of that idea. In other words, this isn't really directly related to those creation stories. Um, but it was inspired by that. I sort of transformed it or synthesized a new meaning for it. So that was the first one I did. Uh, I don't know if it was the second or it was very near the second one that I did was this one. Uh, and it's called Secret of the Ricky Wood. And, and um, the maze, to me, is reminiscent of another Native American symbol that, that is uh, prevalent in uh, the American Southwest, in, in southwestern um, Arizona, and actually northern Mexico. Uh, the Tohono O'odham people uh, have, uh, I don't know if it's a creation story, but it's some kind of a story where there's a maze with a little man standing at the outside of the maze. And I don't know if, what, exactly what that has to do with creating the world or something, but that's kind of what I was thinking when I saw this, and this sort of turns it around, where I'm thinking of crows being inside this maze and working their way out to the outside. And then like when you get outside, this one's eating fruit. It's actually one of the same birds that's eating berries over here. I used him over there. So they're flying around and finding their way out, and then they land in these trees. And the, the title of this, Secret of the Rookie Wood, this is the Rookie Wood out here, and they're trying to, to find their way to the Rookie Wood, and the secret is the path. That is the inspiration for that, and again, this is sort of synthesized because it's sizing icons from other icons, comes from, if you remember this right, the third, act, I only looked this up yesterday because I don't really have this memorized in general, but the third act, second scene of Shakespeare's play, Macbeth, and the quote is, the night thickens, no, the light, the light thickens, and the crow makes wing to the rookie wood. Mm -hmm. And so that's like, there's my rookie wood. And I think I'd actually looked that up before I was inspired to put the trees on here, because I'd worked on the, the maze so much that uh, then I decided, well, I need something to fill in the gaps around it, unless I wanted to do a circular picture. So that's where that one came from. And again, it's tied to to uh, Native American myths and also to um, literature. Steampunk Moon. Mm -hmm. um, this is a combination of two photographs from uh, a place called Blackwood, Blackfoot Pathways in Lincoln, Montana, which we're going to go over there tomorrow because we haven't been there a lot since I took those pictures. And this background here was um, the inside of the teepee burner that's at this old lumber mill teepee burner, all rusted with these streaks running down it, and this hole where there was a smokestack or a pipe going out of there at one time. Looks like the sun, with, with, or a moon in this case, with rays coming out. And then somewhere in the park, there was also these, these uh, tree stumps that had been carved into this little village. So, I took pictures of it, I took pictures of that, and then I worked them together and adjusted the lighting on the, the little village and stuff to get this scene. And it's called Steampunk Moon because if you look closely, you see the seams in the, uh, the metal teepee burner that's got all the rivets and stuff, which is very reminiscent of, of the steampunk kind of art that you see around the This is just more of a decorative one. Doesn't have, you know, just, I put an interesting background behind it, a picture of two ravens out of, out of down in Bellston Park. This is one of my favorite ones here. Uh, it's called Becoming Raven. And this toured with um, the Montana Artmobile a few years ago. And I went to a, a school near Bozeman down in uh, uh, Gallagher Gateway and talked to their kids there at the school about this picture. Because it's part of the exhibit that was being shown them. And so the story I told them was that this is a guy, this is a tree farm, that's why these trees are all in rows, and that's in fact what it is, it was over in Oregon, a tree farm, and we happened to, we were going out to the coast and drove by there, and Amy and I stopped and walked around and took pictures in there. And so this story is, this guy was the caretaker at the, at the tree farm, and he lived there all by himself for months and months by himself, nobody else around, because nobody 
is to go to a tree farm until they're ready, ready to harvest it. But um, he became friends with all the crows that were in the neighborhood. And so he used to run through the forest, run through the tree farm with these birds. And he dreamed of becoming a raven at some point. And so this is him running like the wind with the ravens, and he's going to be turning into a raven sometime soon. And so the ravens and the crows came from the same places that those come from. You know, all the, like, a lot of these have been reused in many different pictures. The guy is actually a white statue that, through the magic of working with Photoshop, I turned it into a dark side because he's turning colors to become like a raven. And that's actually a statue, a little more than a life-size statue in the National Art Museum in uh, Beijing, China. Mm -hmm. So I mixed Chinese influence with uh, an Oregon tree farm and just crows and ravens and stuff like that. This is another one that has its roots in, in China. Uh, I was over there, actually I've been over there four times. Twice was for uh, when it was when a group of artists from around the country uh, mostly from Montana, but other places as well, LA and on the East Coast. And um, we went over there as a group of artists, an art organization invited us and, and um, we did a big exhibit at a museum or somewhere over in China. And then they were nice enough to take us on a 10 day, two week tour of some part of China. Mm -hmm. And um, the first time I was there, we went out to this canyon out in, uh, the mountains kind of west of, of Shanghai um, a ways and we went up this canyon and I don't know if you've ever seen those um, Chinese paintings of, of uh, uh, misty scenes with mountains just receding in the background and I always thought those were like you know they were just sort of made up or exaggerated they're not because that's what it was in that canyon the day we were there and I was so excited and I took these pictures so this hill is from there this hill is from there and uh, this pagoda was on the hill at the bottom of this canyon. But the background here, what you see is receding um, trees. The picture is actually upside down from what I took it. What those are is drips of colorful um, rust. Uh, rust and other, uh, <laughs> and other uh, erosion, corrosion, that's the word I was trying to think. The, the background is actually corrosion on a piece of sheet metal uh, galvanized sheet metal that has the curviness to it and an old, old ghost town in Nevada that I stopped at. So you can see those are the drips running down and on each uh, rib of that metal there was this, this actual rust color stuff. And ever since I took that picture I thought this looked like one of those paintings to me and then after I went to China I was like I can make one of those. And then I thought well I gotta put crows in there so I can put a whole flock of them. But, I really like this one because it, 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 and there's a poem that goes with this, but I'm sorry, I, I don't remember what the, because it's kind of long, but, uh, but it had to do with ascending Tiananmen Mountain in a dream, and that was roughly the name of the poem when it was translated, and this happened to be Tiananmen Canyon that we were walking up, and then I discovered the poem, so it fit in perfectly to the, to the name of the picture. Okay, this one is called Conjuring Freedom, and the genesis for this image came about um, because I was studying or looking at M.C. Escher uh, drawings and um, he has this drawing of, of his hand with a uh, gazing ball or a mirrored ball in there and it shows his reflection in it and I thought it was purely a um, mechanical exercise. I wonder if I could make a ball like that in, photo, in photography, and so I studied up on it, and I found out you can take an image and kind of fake wrapping it around a sphere. And uh, so I thought, okay, I did that. And I figured, okay, here's how you do it, now I gotta make something out of this. So I made this composition, and because it, to me it looked like a um, crystal ball from a magician or something. So here's the story behind this one. Um, these two ravens, belong to a magician. And I'm thinking of, if you've ever seen um, Fantasia, the Walt Disney movie, and there's um, uh, Mickey Mouse 
is the sorcerer's apprentice and he's got the, the broom and he's supposed to be sweeping up and he, he goes to the book of spells and he comes up with these spells and makes the broom do, you know, and they were taking water out of the thing and it got carried away and it flooded the place and stuff. But that's, so this, this is a magician's spell book here. Uh, it's actually that in it and the, the desk and the scene with the chair and the paperwork and the, the, the quills and stuff. It's a um, historic recreation of an early records room in the city hall in Paris in, uh, on the Ile de la Cité or however you pronounce it. So that's a picture that I had taken years ago in Paris. Uh, and I had the book on it already, so this is perfect. So I put the, put the gazing ball on there. And so these two, I mean, because every magician, magician worth his salt back in the day, the Merlin type, they must have had crows or ravens as, as some of their uh, helpers. And so these guys are kind of getting tired of hanging around with the magician. So they're trying to conjure up freedom. And they, they've got this scene of birds, ravens flying free out in front. This is actually, it's hard to tell, but it's a mountain covered with snow and it's an uh, immigrant peak down in Paradise Valley south of Livingston, Montana that I took and the, these ravens flying around. So they're gazing in that ball and contemplating this freedom that they want to get and trying to use the book to find out what that is. So that's the story behind this one, Country and Freedom. And then, again, all sorts of uh, symbolic and contextual influences went into to making that. And that's kind of the way most of these work is like, I get sort of random thoughts in my brain sometimes. Or, you know, I talked about the waking dreams where things are just sort of flying around in there and, and combining that don't make any sense except for in a dream. And, and um, so I try to, try to uh, remember what some of those things were and if they seemed interesting enough then I would try to work them into a photograph. So it's sort of a combination of that effort plus I go out and I take lots of pictures of lots of things and some of them make really good individual photographs but some of them like, you know, this would be a good part of a story or something like the, the guy, the running guy with the crows in the country or becoming raven, um, you know, it's a great image by itself and it's a great sculpture when I saw it but putting it in the context of, a, of another scene was, was kind of neat because I said I like this, I also like the image of the trees themselves and so putting them together really, really added to both of those and made them into something totally new. Um, this guy here is called the Traveler. Um, there's a couple reasons for calling it one. It's like this guy walking around. It looks like he's traveling somewhere. And for a while I was even imagining he was carrying a suitcase, but there isn't really one here. So that picture was taken in um, Nicaragua. We were down there for a couple of weeks in Granada, Nicaragua one time, and it was just, Something that had been painted, I guess, on the wall, and then uh, some of it had peeled away, so there was this really white spots here and here and up there. Um, and then this, all this markings around the outside was on, was on a black wall that people had scratched in white on someplace in China, I think it was in China. Mm -hmm. And so I took pictures of that, put him on that background, and then because I was starting to think, okay, it's traveling, it's been all over the world, I went very um, domestic for the other thing, which is these maps here. And these maps are actually of um, part of the state of Kansas, where I grew up. And this actually Winfield, Kansas, is which you can barely see there. And where I grew up was in Wichita, which was like up here in Kansas, somewhere up there in the north. But anyway, it, all taken together, is, it, it reflects traveling worldwide, and so, Perfect to call it the trail. Okay, this one, uh, day is night, is pretty self-explanatory. If any of you were around at the right place, and back in 2017 when we had that total eclipse of the sun, we were down in Idaho Falls, and um, took, I took a bunch of pictures of the eclipse down there, and then the the rest of the photo I already had. I had made this this image of these uh, crows and ravens flying together in a group, and and I. Put this interesting blue background on it, so I'd superimpose that over the top of the eclipse to get this real ethereal looking uh, or surreal looking uh, scene from that. It's called First Crow on the Moon. I don't know why I decided to put the crow in there, just because I guess because it was fun, but this photograph that the crow is in, except for the crow, that's one photograph. 
that I took. And it's in our living room. This is a, uh, a leather covered bench and um, this is the top edge of an of a outlet cover. And I was sitting on the couch across from that enough times ago. For some reason I kept us attracted to that so I took a picture of it. And what I was thinking about at the time is it's kind of like a, a, a astronomical thing. And uh, you know, the, the, the earth rising from behind the moon or whatever when the Apollo astronauts are on the moon. And, but it's square, so uh, and a nod to what well, little art history I do know, I call it Cubist Sunrise, or Cubist Moon so. And then I was like, okay, that's cool. But then I was like, I'm just going to put a crow in there, too. And actually, that's a raven. So cool. Well, no, it is a crow. That's why I call it a crow. So anyway, it's just my uh, homage to a, uh, a novel, a Chinese science fiction novel that was translated into English, and it has to do with a um, uh, astrophysics problem about how when you, when you have two orbiting stars, it's easy to predict their location and the time that they're going to be anywhere in the orbit. But if you have throw a third one in there, for some reason, that seems to be beyond the capabilities of prediction. So you don't know what's going to happen. And, and in, this, in this novel, there was this planet that was circling, circling, circling one of those stars. And every time three, the three suns would appear in the sky at the same time, which only happened you know, every, I don't know, an eon or a thousand years, maybe hundreds of years. But when that happened, it got so hot people couldn't survive. But over the years, they had evolved to the point where they would just dehydrate, they would desiccate. So this guy walking down the, uh, what was a beach on the ocean, uh, and he'll just dry up and fall over. And then once one of the, when the, one of the suns disappears from the sky, um, he reconstitutes when it rains and, and the way they go. So that way, over a very long period of time, they're able to continue and build a culture even though they were out of it for long, long periods of time. And the pyramid was a major feature and part of the story, so that's why that's there. Uh, the background for this is uh, actually the, the, the hazy look and stuff came from a forest fire near Bozeman some years ago. The three suns are <laughs> variations on a, um, just a, a pattern on a plastic trash can lid that I saw one time, and I decided, that's good, I'm going to photograph that. Um, and this actually was the beach, it was Cannon Beach in, on the coast of Oregon, uh, the guy walking along the, the beach there, so that's, that's what that means. And the pyramid, and I, I might explain that if I get to this other one, other one over here that we started, where we started with the, the pyramid, where that pyramid came from, it's actually the same one in both these pictures. This one, came about because I thought, I want to make crows flying around a Mobius strip. And a Mobius strip, this thing here, is a one surface, three-dimensional object. So if you think about that, actually, yeah, it, it's hard to imagine because even if you take a piece of paper, there are two sides to that. There's a front side and a back side, and you ignore the thickness. Um, so that, in a sense, is, is two-sided, two-dimensional. Whereas this, if you follow this on around on a Mobius strip, you never get to the edge of the paper because there is none. And you cover, there's only one surface. And these birds flying are, are covering that whole surface. And so I, it, it's called Mobius Crow because of that. But then the rest of the background, this reflects um, something, because really, this looks also like an infinity sign. And it's sort of that infinity or continuing non non-ending uh, thing is reflected in these three photographs, which actually is a little hard to tell, but they actually reflect the life cycle. Here you have um, a tree that was dug up, tree stump, dug up in an excavation for a hospital addition in Bozeman. So you got this tree that's died. This one is um, um, a burn tree, although I toned it brown just because it fit better in the photograph. It was charred tree down in Yellowstone area when the fire's down there. So uh, you get this, you know, going from burned to chopped down and, and, and uprooted. 
to over here, whereas this looks like it might be a dead tree. If you look close enough, it's actually a tree in the springtime with buds coming out, so it shows the life being renewed in the cycle of trees. So you get this, this sort of infinite, hopefully infinite cycle going here of life and death. One of the inspirations besides General Mandala's that inspired this was the fact that, uh, uh, again, Native American people did buffalo hide uh, paintings, and not all of them, but some of them had circles on them with animals, and so uh, going from the, the, uh, the mandalas of the, of the Hindu and the Buddhist to the, uh, to the Native American uh, hide paintings, and because it was sort of as a nod to the buffalo hide paintings, the background here is actually the back side of a buffalo hide that I photographed. And so that's where the textures and the wrinkles and stuff you see came from that. Mm -hmm. um, and this one I'll just mention quickly. Uh, again, the Chinese influence. This is, this is the Chinese symbol for a crow or a raven in the middle there. And then you have ravens around it with a little set sun again, I guess, um, in there. And also ravens up here with magpies in between. And this has some significance in the Chinese realm because um, blackbirds, crows, and ravens in particular are considered bad luck in, uh, in China. And my, my Chinese artist friend over there that I got to know based on my trips, he said, you know, these would not sell very well in, in China. And I said, why is that? And he said, and he told me why. Oh, well, that's interesting. Well, the other interesting thing is that magpies are considered good luck or good fortune. They're, they're harbingers of good fortune in, in, in China, so go figure, you know. But, so here you've got the mixture of the two. Um, I put this sort of a, a background on it that looked to me like, sort of like burned parchment, like the old wanted posters you see in the Wild West that kind of curled and burned. And I didn't know what to title this, and I was listening to, having been listening to um, the radio at the time, and they were playing some music. It was kind of nice music. And when it ended, the, uh, the DJ said, uh, that's a certain, such and such song by this group called Vintage Trouble. And I go, perfect, there's my name for this. So I s stole from their musical <laughs> title. So, you know, just thinking about pyramids in and, and, and Egypt and, and the fact that when you're there in Egypt or when you think about stories over there, I've never been there, um, you think about well, it's the desert, you know, the Sahara and the edge of the Sahara. And you've got pyramids, and you're going to have camels or a caravan crossing in front of them. So I made a caravan because I was doing crows and ravens. I made a caravan of crows and ravens. So you can see that, that at least this one's actually even carrying something, which is what people in caravans would do, or camels in caravans would, would carry something. So, but I just want to say real briefly where this pyramid came from. And this is, uh, I guess you might say, I'm sort of appropriating. Uh, somebody else's artwork in uh, the Seattle Art Museum, um, <laughs> at least at the time we were there, there was a sculpture. It was big. It was maybe that long and, and about that wide. And it had a, some kind of a piece of steel on, uh, on one side of it and then up and down. And then it had a flat piece of steel here. And in between them, there was this uh, vertical piece of kind of scratched up and hazy plexiglass. So this was actually the shadow on this piece of steel behind this plexiglass running over this way. Uh, and because of the lighting in the gallery created this shadow with the gradations of gray there. And then this foreground is simply a piece of steel coming out this direction horizontally from the 